So, um, folks, I'm just going to lay out the rules for the questions. Um, I'm usually a very flexible chair in terms of time, but as we've done for the meetings on uh, on this issue, uh, we're going to stick to the time limits. And as a result, I would ask uh, if the witness, where somebody is asking for a, a quick answer, is, is it could be a little bit succinct. Uh, but I'll, I'll obviously want you to be able to finish your answers. So we're going to start. So uh, the first round is six minutes conservative, six liberal, six NDP, six liberal. And I'll let everybody know in advance of every round what the what the time limits are. We'll start with Ms. Wright. Thank you very much, Ms. Wilson-Raybould. I appreciate your patience on getting here today. It hasn't been an easy path, but I know that Canadians really appreciate it and they appreciate your testimony today. And I just want to start off by saying that I believe every word that you said today. And I appreciate your honour and I appreciate your honesty and I appreciate your integrity and grit in coming forward in the way you have. So I do have some questions, though, and I'd be grateful for your input and your point of view. Um, First and foremost, uh, I'd like to know, the Prime Minister has said that you will be able to discuss all relevant information, but do you believe that there is relevant information that you are unable to include in your 30-minute statement that would be helpful for the committee? Well, thank you for the, the comments and, and the question. Um, as I said in my letter to the committee yesterday, as I said in my remarks today, the extent of the order in council and the waiver of privilege and confidentiality extends to January the 14th when I was sworn in as the Minister of Veterans Affairs. So it does not include any conversations that occurred thereafter. It does not include conversations that I may or may not have had with the Prime Minister. And it does not include the conversation that I had with my former Cabinet colleagues um, after my resignation from Cabinet. Do you think those would be relevant to our considerations? Well, I believe that having heard some of the deliberations and questions asked by the committee over the course of the meetings that you've had, um, some of the questions would um, be answered if that information was made available. One of the, one of the important pieces of your, of your testimony today what were the, the number of names that you provided for us, giving us a different list of characters that have been involved in this situation since it began in September. I'm wondering if you'd be so kind to provide us with a full list of those names. I've jotted down a few of them, but I don't have the complete listing. Would that be something you'd be willing to do for us? I, I believe the full list of names is contained within the remarks that I think are being distributed. Um, okay. But if I um, counted incorrectly, I will provide all of the names. I appreciate it. Just on page 14, you mentioned that there were various officials that came forward at the time. If you have any recollection of who the various officials were, that would be helpful for us in terms of making sure we have a complete list of all the, of all the um, witnesses. Um, on January 7, you have pointed out to us that you were told that you were being removed as the um, Attorney General. Um, as well, you posted a very lengthy Facebook post after your movement to the Minister of Veterans Affairs, but I would assume that you thought a lot about what you would include in a note like this during the time when you were actually Attorney General. And as such, I, I think and I believe that the statement that you made, even though it was on when you were Minister of Veterans Affairs, technically did come to light and, and was part of your thought process when you were Attorney General. And I just wanted to ask you a couple questions about, about your Facebook post. The first one, and I quote, it's where, you, and you mentioned it in your remarks, it has always been my view that the Attorney General of Canada must be nonpartisan, more transparent, and in this respect, always willing to speak truth to power. Do you believe, for the record, that you were removed as the Attorney General because you spoke truth to power on the topic of the SNC ongoing prosecution? Well, uh, thank you for, for the question, and I um, am going to have to be very careful what I say. I understand. Um, I believe that I am able to speak to my thought processes um, uh, from January the 7th up to and in, up to the time that I was sworn in as the Veterans Affairs Minister. Yes. Um, I think it's apparent from my remarks that I was uh, concerned that the reason why I was being shuffled out of the Minister of Justice and Attorney General um, possibly was uh, because of a decision I would not take on SNC and the DPA. I raised those concerns with the Prime Minister and with Jerry Butts. Um, and as I said in my remarks, um, 
those were um, denied. Um, I cannot speak to anything that I thought about after that point. I, I appreciate that. Second, um, second part of this letter, you say that the unique and independent aspects of the dual role of the Minister of Justice and the Attorney General of Canada are even more important. I know Canadians across the country expect such high standards to continue to be met, especially in the uncertain times in which we now live, and I expect this to continue. I'd like to know if you are concerned that it's possible that the independence of the Office of the Attorney General is being eroded now, given what you've told us in your testimony today, your understanding that the current Attorney General was to be briefed on the SNC-Lavalin deferment a decision. Well, thanks for the for the question, and I w will not comment on the current Attorney General, um, but I will comment on um, when I was the Attorney General and the thoughts that I had um, when I was on vacation in Bali um, and when I received a, a call from the Prime Minister. Um, while I was the Attorney General through these four months, uh, leaving aside all of the very inappropriate political pressure, uh, interference. Um, I was confident in my role as the Attorney General that I was the final decision maker on whether or not um, uh, an, a directive would be um, introduced on the SNC matter. So I knew as long as I was the Attorney General, this would not occur. Um, I had concerns that when I was removed as the Attorney General that this potentially might not be the case. I decided that um, I would embrace this new role, a very important role, and I really want to say publicly that uh, the role of Veterans Affairs is an incredibly important role, and I took it very seriously. Um, but I had decided to take on the role um, requested of me by the Prime Minister, but I had concerns, and I knew that in my new role, still sitting around the Cabinet table, if there had been a directive that was placed into the Gazette, I would have resigned immediately from Cabinet. Thank you very well much. Uh, Ms. O'Connell. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you for being here today and for providing your notes. I think they're helpful. Um, my set of questions, I want to kind of get a, a general sense of some timelines. I know you've laid it out here, but just in trying to keep up a little bit. Um, would you say, or is it fair to say that in and around, and if I have the wrong date, please correct me, September 17th, I think is when you first met with the Prime Minister uh, on which where it wasn't the, the purpose of the meeting wasn't at first for uh, the SNC Lavalin but it was brought up and is it fair to say was it at that point that you felt the questions of um, your role and on this matter that you were uncomfortable at that point or would you say you were uncomfortable from the initial feedback that you heard that your chief of staff had been contacted by Mr. Chin. So let's kind of start there. So there's a couple of questions yeah. in there. Um, if I don't answer them, please let me. Yeah, uh, no um, problem. Uh, so the, the reason for the, I requested the September 17th meeting, as okay. I said, on a, on a different equal, on an important matter. Um, uh, as I said, the Prime Minister um, brought up SNC and the Deferred Prosecution Agreement. And uh, with the clerk present, we had conversations about SNC. Um, well, he brought up SNC about jobs and the potential of job loss. And I will say, um, entirely appropriate conversations for the prime minister to bring up. Um, what I will say is that the conversations turned to be completely inappropriate when there was discussion about um, the Quebec election about the fact that the Prime Minister was a member of Parliament uh, in Quebec. It was at that point that um, I immediately um, became concerned 
and because I was the attorney general, um, sought to um, have a conversation with the prime minister about the law, about the role of the attorney general and the necessary independence that the attorney general must have in exercising their discretion, in this case around a prosecution. Um, the political concerns that were raised prompted me to ask the question of the Prime Minister directly if he was politically interfering with my role as the Attorney General. So at that point, my senses were heightened. Um, the Prime Minister assured me that that was not the case. Um, but um, soon thereafter, um, I instructed my staff and myself as well to uh, ensure that we had a very detailed chronology of all meetings um, and uh, conversations about SNC and deferred prosecution agreements. Thank you. So you wouldn't say that it was a red flag um, necessarily on the topic or the conversations um, with Mr. Chin on September 7th because it was those conversations about businesses. It was once the conversation in your mind changed to uh, any politics? Or were you equally concerned on September 7th? On the September, on the earlier meetings prior to the meeting with the Prime Minister, um, Ben Chin had conversations with my Chief of Staff. And again, in terms of public policy, in terms of having discussions about impacts of decisions uh, and loss of jobs. Um, that was appropriate. Okay. Um, but I will say, um, in those calls, and I don't have my notes in front of me, but I have a pretty uh, uh, generous memory, um, Mr. Chin raised the Quebec election. And I will say, it's okay to talk about job losses. It's okay to talk about it in initial conversations. But when those topics continue to be brought up after there's a clear awareness that a decision has been made, it becomes inappropriate. Thank you for clarifying. And, um, sir, I just want to clarify on that point because you mentioned you have notes and a pretty good memory. Um, but in the uh, written submission or your verbal remarks, any conversations, at least from September 7th, 8th, I think 11th, um, at least involving Mr. Chin, were with your staff, not you directly. Did you leave out conversations that you also had, or was it just notes that you had from your conversations with somebody who had a conversation with Mr. Chin? I just want to clarify. Cause yeah, sure. No, I'm happy, I'm happy to answer the question, if you'd permit me, just to um, speak about how ministers, at least my minister's office, works. Um, I have an incredibly close relationship, necessarily so, with my chief of staff. I also at that time had an, a very close relationship with my judicial affairs advisor, who throughout some of this period of time was acting as my chief of staff, given that we were out of the country. Um, whenever my chief of staff has a conversation, um, she takes notes on the conversation and immediately relays the conversation to me, particularly in cases where there's concerns about the conversations that were had. Um, so the close relationship and the necessary closeness of the relationship um, makes it um, that she and I um, uh, are um, sharing important information and proceeding on the same basis with respect to the meetings, telephone calls, and emails that she would receive. It is her obligation, and it was my instructions for her to provide me with all of these details. Thank you. And um, Ms. O'Connell, your last question. Okay, perfect. Thanks. Uh, and then it was in here, I'm sorry, I don't remember, I don't recall, but it did say somewhere in these conversations that either you or your staff related on behalf of you that you would be in this at least September time frame open to having further conversations on the SNC Lavalin matter. Is that not correct? Or in September you had felt comfortable and confident that the decision was made? Well, I, during that time frame, I had uh, commenced conversations and had asked for briefings, as I regularly did when I received a Section 13 notice. Um, 
I think it's fair for me to say that there was a heightened awareness about this Section 13 notice that came in with respect to SNC. These conversations were all internal to the Department of Justice, and I was exercising with my attorney general hat on um, what was appropriate for me to consider based on what I read in the Section 13 note from the director. Um, we did not reach out externally. Um, we, um, the Minister of Finance's office, reached out to my department, and then these conversations began. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Rankin. Well, thank you. <coughs> Mr. Chair, I have to say that I am very shaken by what I've heard here today. I, I've, I've been a lawyer for over 40 years. I've taught a generation of law students about the rule of law. And what I've heard today should make all Canadians extremely upset. Now, Ms. Wilson-Raybaugh, we're both from British Columbia. We've known each other for many years, and I need you to know that I believe you entirely. I need you, I need you to know that. And I, I want you to know as well that I, I'm ve I, I very much admire your courage in being here and, and telling Canadians what you have experienced. Because I believe, if we believe you, which I do, that there is no other conclusion that one can reasonably draw, but that there was a sustained, consistent effort to interfere politically with the critical role that an attorney general must play in our legal system. You have said, to, go, to say what, to quote back what you said, I experienced a consistent and sustained effort by many people within the government to seek to politically interfere in the exercise of prosecutorial discretion in my role as the attorney general of Canada in an inappropriate effort to secure a deferred prosecution agreement. You talked of 10 phone calls, 10 meetings specifically about that. And then you talked about what I would call the consequences and threats if you didn't knuckle under. You said the potential co for consequences and veiled threat if a deferred prosecution was not available to the SNC were, made, were, were brought to your attention during those conversations. So my question is this, how can Canadians, if they believe you, as I do, draw any other conclusion but that there was an attempt to politically interfere with your role as our independent Attorney General. Uh, well, thank you for, for the comments and, and the question, albeit I think the question is somewhat rhetorical. Um, I sought in my testimony today to state facts and in my testimony, I came to the conclusion and throughout the four months um, that there was a sustained um, effort and attempt to politically interfere with my discretion as the Attorney General of Canada. It was inappropriate. And um, on January the 11th, uh, you said that th the Friday before the cabinet shuffle, your former deputy minister was called by the clerk and told that the shuffle was happening and that the deputy minister said one of the first conversations that the new minister will be expected to have with the prime minister would be on SNC-Lavalin. So it appears to a person, a reasonable person, looking at that, that you were removed from your role because you would not change your mind, despite these persistent and consistent efforts to have you do so, and that because you didn't change your mind, you were fired from the role of Attorney General. That's what I take from the material. In other words, it, there appears to be a direct link from that conversation the day before the Cabinet shuffle and what occurred, your removal from your role as Attorney General. That would appear to be what's said. Now, I have a question. After this what you call consistent and sustain, sustained pressure to reverse your decision. I'd like you to tell us a little bit more why you did not change your mind. I did not change my mind to enter into or to issue a directive to the Director of Public Prosecutions on the matter of... A, putting out an invitation to negotiate a, a remediation agreement with SNC because 
I had the benefit of reading the Section 13 note of conducting my own due diligence around the appropriateness of entering into a deferred prosecution agreement with SNC. I had the benefit of um, feedback and briefings from my departmental officials as well as my political staff. Um, I made my mind up prior to the September 17th meeting and for those people that know me, uh, my decision making process takes into account many views and I welcome many views on public policy issues. And having taken into account many diverse views, um, knowing confidently um, my role, my independent role as the Attorney General and the need to make a decision, and I know you are studying the Shawcross principles and I don't want to get into talking about the Shawcross <laughs> principles, but as the Attorney General, you make decisions with your judicial hat on, um, leaving aside political considerations or otherwise. Mm -hmm. I had determined that I was not going to issue a directive it was inappropriate to interfere with the discretion of the Director of Public Prosecutions um, and having made up my mind, taking into account all of the information, um, again, for those who know me, I was not going to change my mind. Thank you. Thank you very much. Ms. O'Connell. Thank you. Thank you. Um, so following up on some of those timeline questions, I just want to, um, it looks like in their response, you didn't uh, meet again with Jerry until December 5th in terms of uh, raising your specific concerns that you felt this was interference. So just given that how long you've known Jer Mr. Butt, sorry, and um, I believe it's been widely reported, uh, he was someone who rec recruited you, so you had known each other even prior to politics to run for the Liberal Party. Um, I'm just curious if it is fair to say that it wasn't until the December 5th meeting with Jerry, Mr. Butts, that um, you hadn't messaged him about your concerns about the what you described as uh, constant pressure. If you had communicated with him in any way via text, email, whatnot, prior to that December 5th meeting to say that you felt um, these conversations needed to stop. Well, I'm, I'm not going to comment on the nature of, of my relationship um, with Mr. Butts. That's fine. Um, I, but I will say that uh, um, it was the Prime Minister, the then leader, that uh, recruited me okay. into the party. And, of course, uh, there were ongoing conversations between uh, him and, and Mr. Butts. Sorry, um, can I just say then, is it fair to suggest, though, that you had known him and you were comfortable with him, you had talked to him, I would assume, regularly? Yeah, of course. Okay. I, I, had, uh, I had fairly regular conversations with, uh, with Jerry. In fact, Jerry said um, to me many times, and I don't think this is a secret, that I talk to you more than I talk to most ministers. And I appreciated that relationship. Um, to your, the second part of your question, um, as I said, there was sustained efforts at communications, not only with myself, but with my office, um, from various members of the Prime Minister's office, including Mathieu Bouchard and Elder Marquez, both of whom are policy advisors and legal advisors to the Prime Minister, as well as to, um, Jerry Butts and Katie Telford. It would have been, in my view, um, not uh, a secret um, that these were concerns that I had. But if it, it, just following up on that, if it wasn't a secret that those were your concerns, why unt not until December 5th did you communicate with uh, Mr. Butts specifically about those communications? Um, it, it was somewhat stated that you would be willing to, or someone in your office would look at the matter back in September. So if it was constant, um, and you acknowledge that you spoke to Mr. Butts on a regular basis, why not raise it earlier in September or October about those ongoing conversations with anyone in the, in the PMO or other ministers' offices? 
or did you, I guess is a fair point, did you communicate prior to that um, about those concerns? Yeah, I With appreciate Mr. the question and, and being able to clarify again the timeline. I absolutely communicated in September, um, not to Jerry Butts, but to the Prime Minister of the country, mm -hmm. the concern that I had. I communicated um, to the clerk of the Privy Council, who, has, as everybody knows, is the Deputy Minister to the Prime Minister. I communicated um, to uh, Elder Marquez and to Mathieu Bouchard. I communicated to the Deputy Minister of Justice and the Deputy Attorney General of Canada. Um, and when the efforts, the sustained efforts of um, political interference continued, I felt, and I have text messages when I requested the meeting with Jerry, mm -hmm. um, that ultimately resulted on December the 5th, that it was time um, to reiterate my concerns uh, to him uh, about the inappropriate nature of these conversations, as I did to Minister Morneau uh, in October, I believe, or September, I might be getting the dates wrong, um, so about the inappropriateness and that they had to stop. So then you didn't mention Ms. Telford. Um, so is it fair to say you didn't speak with Ms. Telford, um, I guess, between those September dates? Uh, or did you ever mention it to Ms. Telford about uh, or have communications via text, emails, and writings that what you um, say were continued pressure? Uh, I just to correct, um, it was mm -hmm. September the 19th that I had the discussion with Minister Morneau. Mm -hmm. um, to your question, most of the conversations that I have with the Prime Minister's office at the highest level, either uh, Katie or Jerry, would be with Jerry Butts. Okay. Um, but to be clear, my chief of staff uh, had direct conversations with Mr. Butts and Ms. Telford, as I described in detail on December the 18th. So early, um, and then after September 19th, that meeting with the Prime Minister, did you speak to him again about the continued uh, pressure that you felt? Uh, the meeting I had with the Prime Minister was on uh, September the 17th. And um, after September the 17th, I did not directly talk to the Prime Minister until January the 7th. But um, in between those dates, there were, as I described, numerous meetings uh, with the Prime Minister's office senior staff, as okay. well as the Clerk of the Privy Council. And you mentioned earlier in my first round that um, you felt it was entirely appropriate to have the conversation about the jobs and, and those types of impacts I'm, I'm paraphrasing here but and then you mentioned Ms. Uh, Minister Morneau and the conversation you had you referred to on the 19th which was in the house I believe you said in the testimony and you said that he mentioned job losses so what made you feel that that conversation was then inappropriate was inappropriate yes so to the first point about mentioning jobs and job losses, as I said in my in my evidence, I, including the conversation I had with the Prime Minister, I do not believe it is inappropriate right. to have conversations about job losses, about um, SNC, in the early stages where ministers can raise these issues with the Attorney General. Um, what is inappropriate is the long sustained um, discussions about the job losses after it is very clear that I had made my decision and was not going to pursue a DPA. Um, but leaving aside job losses, um, the conversations that I had, where they became um, very clearly inappropriate was when political issues came up, like the election, in Quebec, like losing the election if SNC were to move their headquarters. Conversations like that, conversations like the one I had with the clerk of the Privy Council who invoked the Prime Minister's name throughout the entirety of the conversation, spoke to me about the Prime Minister being dug in, spoke to me about um, his concerns as to what would happen. Um, in my mind, those were veiled threats, and I took them as such. Um, that is entirely inappropriate. Thank you very much. Uh, so now we move.